And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. Today's guest is Mary Joyce, who has worked for two major metropolitan newspapers, is a writer of books and magazine articles, and is currently the editor and researcher of skyshipsovercashiers.com. We'll be discussing the Cherokee Little People, Bigfoot, and more. Mary, welcome back. It's so great to see you again. Absolutely. I hear you're a little bit hot there in Texas, but Mm -hmm. uh, anyhow, I hope your AC stays on and uh, keeps you cool. Thank you. Yeah, me too. I should only do the podcast in the morning because it's so hot in the evening here. I can understand. Before we get started, I want to let everybody know that Mary was on previously, and I think the podcast is number 612. And during that podcast, we talked about UFOs and things that can be found on Google Earth and Google Mars. Yeah, that was, I enjoyed that conversation. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I, I was checking on it before we came on the show. I wanted to make sure I didn't have the same blouse on. <laughs> but anyhow, um, that is the easiest to find if you just scroll down to your major heading, uh, which is UFOs and aliens and things like that. And it's uh, on the top row when you go there. So that's the easiest way to find it. And um, I hope everybody takes a look at it because I discovered stuff that uh, most people don't know about on Mars, on the moon, at the bottom of the ocean in Antarctica. So I encourage people to check out that video also. And I was informing Mary today that I will be releasing a Spanish and Portuguese version. So if you speak those languages and you want to listen to it that way, then I hope you enjoy it. It was kind of fun to hear us uh, uh, speaking in a different language. It it was almost humorous to the ears. Yeah. Well, Mary, who are the Cherokee little people? Well, I'm probably like a lot of people in in your audience. I've never heard of Cherokee little people. And when I moved to the mountains of North Carolina, I began to hear these little legends about them. And I thought that's all it was, was legends. And then one day, um, uh, an elderly man who's highly respected here where I live um, told me, no, they're real. And he had such a great reputation. He was a World War II hero. He was a pastor for like 40 something years in, here in the mountains. Um, and he said that when he was first out of the military, right after World War II, he was involved with construction at Western Carolina University. And when they would cut into what was supposed to be virgin soil, they would find these little square cut tunnels made out, cut into um, very dense uh, red clay. They were square cut with an arch top. If you know anything about construction, the arch makes the tunnel stronger. And like anywhere they were digging, they would run into these little tunnels. Uh, they eventually uh, found uh, little skeletons and uh, he was he was my key to open a lot of doors uh, because I never would have been able to talk to these other men uh, without his help. Uh, you don't just go up to somebody's door and knock and say, hey, I want to talk to you about this or that. And uh, they were all construction workers, almost all of them, uh, during the early days of building Western Carolina University. So I spent one year, uh, not the whole year, but spending my Saturdays around kitchen tables talking to these old timers, hearing their stories about what they had found when they were, you know, running um, construction equipment or whatever. And uh, if he hadn't opened the door, I would never have gotten those stories. So those conversations around the kitchen tables were really, really great. And in the book that I've written about that, um, I have a quick summary of each one of the witnesses, but I also have the dialogue. And I did that for for two reasons. One, so that people can get the feel of the real conversation from the way the people speak. The other reason was I figured I wasn't smart enough to know everything and that about little people and that they might give me a clue that I might overlook if I was just doing like a writer's uh, condensed version of their story. So I have both there. Plus I have lots and lots of photos and location maps. And uh, it's always been my dream that some really good archaeologists will take those clues and find even more evidence. 
When they find the skeletons of these people, are they children's bones or fully formed adult bones, but small? Uh, this will answer your question. One of the professors in the science department used to keep one of these small skulls on his desk as a conversation piece. And he always said it was a child skull from, uh, you know, one of the uh, pyramids, not pyramids, but one of the uh, structures that they had uh, analyzed in the area. And one high school English teacher came in one day and picked it up and looked at it real carefully and said, this is not a child skull. It has all of its wisdom teeth. And it, it wasn't, a, even though it was the size of a, a, a very young child, um, the sutures like in the skull were all knitted together. Uh, that is not the way it is when you're the size of a small child. Um, typically, the Cherokee little people were about three feet tall, some as much as three and a half feet tall. The tunnels were about uh, two and a half feet wide and three and a half, sometimes four feet tall. And they were found all over the campus when they were doing various construction projects. Um, so it took a high school English teacher to figure out, hey, this isn't just a child skull. Do they have any dating of these skeletons? Mm, I don't know if I can actually answer that question. Um, when I was doing the research, all of these men were uh, in their 80s, pushing 90. All of them have died since I've done the interview and the, the or interviews. And the only reason I did the book was I found out that nobody had recorded their stories. I checked the museums. I checked the libraries. There was no record of what these guys had seen and experienced. And just for the sake of history, uh, I decided to do the interviews and do a book about them. Um, and some of the stories got really interesting as far as the experience goes. For example, um, there were moonshiners uh, who were up one of the mountains here. And they were digging a new still or setting up a new still. And they came across what they called, quote, a pile of little bones. And they were these little people bones. And they quickly covered them up because they didn't want anybody to know about it. They didn't want anybody to find their still. Well, one of these old moonshiners actually took me back. He was, I think, 89 at the time, had lost a lot of his vision. He only had the center vision. And he and his wife uh, took me down these old trails to where the old still had been. He could never find it, uh, probably because there wasn't all that much left, but we tried. And so I've met some interesting characters in the pursuit of uh, learning about Cherokee little people. Are there any historical records within the Cherokee Indians that talk about the, the little people? Well, this is kind of, I found this interesting. Once I published this book, Cherokee Little People Were Real, notice it was in the past tense. Notice that, that I have learned stuff since then. Once I published that, the Cherokee realized I was taking the subject seriously and I wasn't going to laugh at them. The white people have a history of laughing at these legends of the little people, so the Cherokee just shut up. Some of my cutest stories came after I did the book. Uh, and if I were to redo the book, I would say Cherokee people are real because there are still some in the remote areas of these mountains. Um, there was one very shy uh, Cherokee woman. She was 29 at the time I met her. She never would have talked to me except we had a mutual friend, and that friend convinced her uh, to talk to me and share her stories, and she told me some cute ones. Um, one of my favorites is she said that her family had a uh, place in the remote part of the reservation, the Cherokee Reservation, uh, where they would have family gatherings. And they set up a small trailer there so they would have a bathroom and a place to cook food. Well, they were up there, um, and she was playing with the other kids. They were playing hide-and-go-seek. She decided to go hide in the shower of the little trailer. And when she pulled back the curtain, there was a little Cherokee man grinning at real big, scared the you-know-what out of her. She went running to her daddy, but she described him as looking like uh, Mowgli from the Jungle Book. So if that gives you an idea of what they look like. And... Um, there's also, she told me a, a number of stories. Another one, um, she had an aunt and uncle that lived in Snowbird, North Carolina. This is much more remote 
than the Cherokee Reservation. There are actually more full-blooded uh, Cherokee living in the Snowbird area than there are on the reservation. And she was down there with her aunt and uncle, and the uncle told her that um, he would show her evidence that the little people came there. And so he took flour and dusted it across the, the porch. And uh, in the morning, you could see these little footprints in the flour on the porch. Now, that may not make total sense, but some of the old Cherokee will put out food for the little people, which would explain why they would, you know, be on their porch. And uh, the, I've often heard that when they forget to put the food out, um, they will hear pebbles hitting their roof, uh, just to remind them, hey, we're here, uh, don't forget us. Do you think the little people are from Earth, or do you think they're possibly ETs? I can, maybe we're all ETs, how's that for an answer? Uh, <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the, the Cherokee came here and found the little people. The little people were here before the Cherokee. And originally, the Cherokee people came from like the Great Lakes region, and some of them migrated down here. When they first arrived here, they found these little gardens, but they didn't see any people around. And eventually, they saw them, these little people, come out of the ground at night to harvest their produce. And so initially, the Cherokee called them the moon people because they came out at night. Some people think it's because they had maybe the big eyes, um, you know, like the, the graves or something, and that would explain why they called them, the, the they, they began to say it was the moon-eyed people. It wasn't. They were just these little people who have features like regular humans, except they're miniature. And they have eyes like regular humans. Um, so the original name was because they came out at night to harvest their food. Inside the tunnels, were there any type of cave drawings or artwork found? The tunnels seem, were made out of red clay, real dense red clay. They seemed to be simply transportation uh, corridors for them to get from one place to another. Uh, they clearly were living underground. And as far as any markings inside those tunnels, the only thing that we ever found was tool marks. And it looked like a tool that would be like this that they did to, to scrape the walls. Um, so they were very uh, functional tunnels. They weren't ones like uh, uh, caves where people went and did artwork. Uh, there is a very large petroglyph rock uh, that's in this area where the Cherokee little people lived. And off the top of my head, it seems like it was like 15 feet across and maybe eight feet in the other direction. Uh, it has these um, uh, hieroglyphs or carvings all over it. Nobody knows what they mean. And the, it, the Cherokee um, have looked at it and it's not their work. They didn't do it. So we think that this is the work of the little people. Um, and to make this even more complicated, more interesting, in the same area where this petroglyph rock is, um, we've had Bigfoot sightings. And it's just very interesting that the little people in the Bigfoot are uh, in the same area. Do you believe that they just use the tunnels underground for transportation only? Or yeah, I just think, it, no, I really do think it was the way they got from one place to another underground. It was just like, you know, their sidewalk. Um, uh, and absolutely no carvings or artwork or anything that have been found in any of them. There weren't any large rooms found underground. Uh, we found uh, a couple on one of the um, bluffs overlooking the university. The university is pretty much surrounded by mountains. And um, we can't tell if they were only used by the Cherokee or if they were used by the little people because it's in the same area. And these are caves where they especially went to live in the winter time where they because they faced the south and so you would get the, the 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 heat of the sun there to keep warm um many people refer to it as the cherokee winter camp um it's very possible that some of those caves that are larger uh, were used by both people again the little people were here first when i think of little people living underground what comes to mind are mythological People like dwarves or gnomes or something like that. 
Yeah. And the only difference being that these actually just look like miniature humans as we know today. And um, there's a couple that I know that live on another ridge not too far from where I live. And they contacted me after great debate between the two of them because they caught a little person in the woods on their um, game camera. And they didn't, one of them thought it was a spirit <clears throat> and one of them thought it was a real little Cherokee. <clears throat> so finally they decided they would share it with me. And it looks, it was in August when it was really hot. And it looks like a, a nude or practically nude little person with straight black hair, which fits the definition that the Indian girl gave me of them looking like Mowgli from the Jungle Book. And um, so I got this video and I had this brainstorm that if you turn up the concentration of the um, color on a film, anything that's alive will go to magenta. Anything that spirit will stay white. So I found um, what I would call convincing uh, ghost pictures, and I tested it with that. There's one picture where there is a ghost on his hands and knees playing with a very live child. And when I turned up the contrast, the little child stayed went into magenta. The ghost stayed white. So I did this with this little person in the woods, and it went magenta. So it was not a spirit. It was definitely uh, a living, breathing uh, little creature. Um, the husband went out by the tree where they where they caught the little person or caught it on on video, and they used a mark on a tree to figure out how tall it was. And then he went and measured it. And it was about three, three and a half feet tall, which is what I hear over and over again as far as the size of the little people. So that was years after I did the book. Cherokee little people were real. It took that long to get something that might actually be a picture of a little person. That's amazing. Now, I think that there are lots of reports of UFOs in the area, and some people even believe that there are UFO bases. So I wonder if there's a connection. There are all sorts of theories about both the Bigfoot and the little people being connected with the star people. You might find it interesting that the Cherokee believe that they originated from the Pleiades. That seems to be very common among many North American Indian tribes. They feel that's where they came from. They often hide their legend stories in tales of the seven sisters. There's seven stars in the Pleiades. And so that's how they would, you know, continue the information or the story about them. Um, I found that really, really interesting. So the Cherokee themselves believe they originated from the stars. Um, it is commonly believed that um, uh, the little people did too, but perhaps further back in time than we humans. Um, there's similar stories with the Bigfoot. And one man in another part of uh, this state <clears throat> has Bigfoot living on his land. What happened was the forestry was clearing all sorts of forest land. So the Bigfoot were ending up on his property, and he became a fanatic about keeping track of the, the Bigfoot, and he kept his video camera handy. And one night he heard them making all sorts of noise, and he grabbed his camera and he went out there, and they were along the tree, the Bigfoot were along the tree line, making noise and looking up at the sky. There was a gold-colored UFO right above them. And uh, so that just fuels the idea that there might be a connection between the, the Bigfoot and the, the, the UFO um, connection. And uh, I, I did get a picture of the um, golden UFO above the Bigfoot. For them to still be alive, to me, suggests that there either has to be a breeding population somewhere or they are popping in and out of our realm through a portal perhaps just like Bigfoot? Um, it gets real confusing when you start talking about portals and stuff. And I hear enough serious reports that that is a real possibility. But I also have done a lot of research, especially with the Bigfoot. And they're also very, very physically real people that are uh, beings that live here. Um, 
And I've seen their footprints and I've seen, there's this trail, there's this cave that's way high up on a very steep ridge. And there's a trail through the mountain laurels. And that's where we always find big footprints. And they head down to a place where there's water and where there's an apple tree. So we have smelled them there. We've seen the footprints there. Uh, they've been heard there. Um, there's another cave in the same basic area that's at the top of a ridge um, with a gravel road. And one of the mountain boys took me back there. And so we got out of the car, or out of his truck. And then we went about a half mile into the woods. He had a machete, not for protection, but to cut a pass so we could get there. He wanted me to see one of the caves where the Bigfoot lived. And when we first began to head toward the cave, uh, we heard this strange uh, bird-like sound, but it didn't sound like any bird we, I'd ever heard. And then in the direction we were headed, it was like there was an answer, the same kind of unique bird call. And then everything went silent. Where we first heard the sound, um, there were two big footprints on a very steep slope. And so we concluded that one Bigfoot was warning the other Bigfoot that these um, humans were headed in, in their direction. And uh, it was a pretty good sized cave. Uh, I'm bad on statistics. It's accurate in my Bigfoot book, but it's like um, maybe eight feet across and five feet tall with a big slab of rock across the top. Um, I confess that I took pictures of it. I was not brave enough to venture into it. The cave you could not see the back of it. And um, uh, I'd like to think I'm as brave as can be, but nope, I'm not, I was not about to go in there. <laughs> if there was, if it wasn't a big foot, it might've been a panther or, you know, a bear or who knows what. But um, those are the kind of stories that uh, I've had firsthand. When you look at the footprints, do they look like human footprints? The ones here do. Um, for some reason, they pretty consistently have been about 16 inches long. Uh, they have the regular five toes. That's not universal. There are some Bigfoot um, that have four toes. There are some that have six toes. Uh, but the ones that we've seen evidence of all have five toes like we do. You mentioned that you smell them. What do they smell like? Um, I would hate to be in a small room uh, with one of them. Um, you know, it's like you'd want to plug your nose. And um, I, 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 it doesn't smell good. <laughs> So, but we did a lot of experiments with the Bigfoot. Um, we found these trails that they would take all the time. So we did food experiments and we would put things out in different containers to see what they liked the best. And um, they're kind of like kids. They love the fruits, except for the oranges. And they don't much care for the vegetables. Uh, some of them they would eat. Uh, when we put asparagus out there just to see how they would react, uh, they reacted like many humans, and we found it that they spit it out on the ground. They didn't care for that at all. Uh, it's pretty universal that they love um, um, apples. They love nuts. Um, we It ended up being an experiment also with the containers. Um, they will not put their hands into something. I have a hunch they've learned that you know they might get trapped in some way. And so uh, when we put out like a, a cooler with a handle, even if we left the lid cockeyed, they would not put their hand in that. They would tip it over and get into it. Finally, we put out a basket without a handle and they took the basket of food down the, the path. And when they finished eating it, they left the basket there. Um, so they're very, very cautious. Have you ever considered setting up a camera near the food so you could catch them? There's many things that we could do, and I have not done as many things as we could do. I wish they, I had a budget to do everything. Are there any historical documents in your area about Bigfoot? We posted a story real recently where a man in uh, Louisiana, who's a professor at Louisiana um, University in Monroe, and he had done a lot of research and found um, Bigfoot stories and reports reports from the 1800s. And so if anybody's interested in reading those, you can go to the website, skyshipsovercashers.com. And it's one of the more recent postings. We have the, the 20 most recent postings on the right-hand side in the column. And so you can click on that and, and read some of the, the historical uh, 
stories that he has discovered. What do you think intrigues you the most about the Cherokee little people? Well, they're little, so they can hide out better than Bigfoot can. It's amazing to me that Bigfoot can can stay out of sight most of the time. They truly want to just avoid us. Um, but the little people, uh, I didn't even know they were still around here, but they're really good at the camouflage, too. They're really good about um, staying away from, uh, you know, people. However, they do know when they can open up with certain people. And there are uh, those among the Cherokee who they will um, make themselves physically present in front of them. I've not had that experience. Even today? Even today, yes. And that was one of the biggest surprises to me. When I wrote the book, Cherokee Little People Were Real, I was talking in the past tense. I did not expect to find any of them still living today. And um, uh, those stories are hard to come by, but uh, they're coming from people that are very, very believable. Now, your other book is called Bigfoot Beyond the Footprints. What else is in there that, that you're giving us? They have families. They have, they're human in so many ways. I'll, uh, I'm trying to figure out what's a good one to tell you. Uh, there's a man who was a deputy sheriff in Florida. He got cancer. He was not an old man. And he retired early and he moved to the, uh, like an old logging road here in the forest of the mountains. And he had his own organic garden, all trying to get more healthy. Um, he began to hear sounds that puzzled him. For example, there's not, there aren't any children around where he lived. And he, he heard children, it sounded like children, playing in the creek. And so that made him wonder. And uh, he heard um, where they would pick up uh, uh, big limbs and bang them against a, uh, another tree. They did this every time somebody in the area did target practicing. They didn't like the guns, so they would protest taking the, this limb and banging it against a big tree. Eventually, he was out on his, I guess his front porch, up at an elevation looking down toward the creek. And it was at night. He had a light by his uh, garage, and he saw a family of Bigfoot go across the path. Um, it was mama, papa, and two teenagers. And eventually, he actually became friends with the male Bigfoot. And the male Bigfoot would come down to the garden when uh, he was working in the garden. And uh, they would communicate telepathically, which is very, very normal with all animals with the Bigfoot. Uh, probably it used to be common with humans, but we seem to uh, uh, disconnect from some of our natural abilities over time. And uh, uh, I just thought that was really neat that they actually became friends and he called him Fred. Does he talk about their conversations? It never got real deep. You know, sometimes you really, really want something deep. Like when I listen to uh, uh, your broadcasts when you feature near-death experiences, the people have had really something traumatic happen in their lives and they focus on that part of the experience. I always want to know, what is it that they learned? What is it they saw that the rest of us haven't seen? And uh, that's the way I feel about uh, uh, the Bigfoot and the uh, little people. The one person I know who has had success in really communicating with the Bigfoot uh, is Joan Ocean, and she's a dolphin expert. This is a brand new story that just got posted today on our website. I haven't even gone and double checked it. I know it's there though. and. Um, she was contacted by somebody here in the continental United States who wanted to know what the trick was to communicate with the dolphin because she wanted to learn how to communicate with the Bigfoot on her land. Eventually, there was this great ongoing conversation with the woman and Joan Ocean, who lives in Hawaii, made a trip to the continental U.S., went out into the woods and communicated with these Bigfoot. She said that this particular clan of Bigfoot, she would regard as ancient wise ones because they were so spiritually and intellectually developed. Not all Bigfoot are. And uh, they actually, uh, uh, there was one that she called the um, Sasquatch medicine woman. And she would actually write notes to her. For example, the first time um, the Bigfoot gave Joan a gift, 
there was this little scrap of paper. It, it said something like a uh, uh, gift for Joan. Um, and um, then there was a male Bigfoot in this same clan and he communicated with her on this pad of paper that Joan provided. So she had a notebook out in the woods with a pen. So they both, so both the Bigfoot and she could communicate. And um, he wrote in pet, petri, uh, not petroglyphs, uh, pictograms. Uh, everything was symbolic, but the medicine woman actually wrote in, uh, printed in English. It wasn't writing, it was printing. Oh, it's amazing. I was just That's a great story. That. So uh, I I think the world of Joan Ocean, she's such a credible, wonderful person. And I encourage your your uh, followers to uh, check that story out. Well, does she tell what the trick was to get them to respond? She zeroed in on the fact that this was a very evolved group of Bigfoot, um, not just your run of the mill. And so they even knew that she, they called her Water Woman. Uh, because she's always in the water with the dolphin. They knew that before she arrived at the at the forest. She invited them to um, uh, visit her in Hawaii, and uh, they printed out a note, which is part of the story that I have posted, um, that um, said, explains why they can't cross the waters where the sun sets, that it's too far. And I think they even called it the salt water. Um, but it was too far for them to go. And uh, just the fact that some of them could actually write, I found fascinating. Do you think that Bigfoot and the little people are actually more evolved than us and more intelligent? Um, not all of them, no, I don't. Uh, clearly, the group that uh, Joan has tapped into and some of the other people, there's a, a Dr. Johnson out on the West Coast, and he has... Uh, tapped in and communicated at a very deep level with the Bigfoot too. Um, and so some of those Bigfoot actually know more about our history. They were here before we were, um, and they are very, very knowledgeable. Uh, but I would not say that all Bigfoot are. It's just like us. We have uh, We have such a range of human beings. Why do you think that we can't ever get good pictures of them or good Because videos? they don't want their pictures taken. And they can hear us, and they know we're coming long before we get there. Uh, it was described that we send out um, uh, vibrations like we're going through the forest with a bullhorn. And so um, they know long before we get there that we're there. Um, and they they will try to avoid us if they possibly can. And they, uh, they uh, I have never seen this, but I am told from people who are around Bigfoot a lot that they really can. Uh, like disappear before your eyes. Um, and I think your listeners like cute stories. Let me tell you a cute Bigfoot story. Sure. Uh, one of the gals has had Bigfoot living on her land since she was a child. And she had a pony and the pony was in a fenced area. And uh, um, puzzling enough, every time she would put the pony up at night, it would be gone in the morning. And she eventually got a big, long boat rope and tied him up. And he still would be gone in the morning and the rope untied. And she would find the pony out in the woods. And his big and, and his um, feed um, container and his water container would be dragged out there. And then one day she saw these little tiny muddy butt prints on the back of the pony. The Bigfoot were taking their children for rides on the pony. Now, if that doesn't sound human, I don't know what does. Is there one eventful story that's well known in the region about Bigfoot? There's one story which is really, really big in my mind, and I've never had a, anything else happen to this extent. It we have the dramatic, scary stuff, and we have the the warm, compassionate stuff all in the same story, but it starts out scary. And it happened at the top of one of these ridges here in Western North Carolina. And to get to this home where this was happening, you go down this, uh, it's probably just about a mile. It's a little one lane road that follows a creek between two mountain ridges. And when you get to the end of the road, it opens up into a big uh, uh, bowl shape, not big, but a little valley. And there's a small house, a big house and a barn and a pond. And 
<clears throat> so what was happening was these people that lived on this land <clears throat> were having really bad Bigfoot experiences happening. Um, it started out um, that they would have these uh, muddy fig uh, fingerprints, big ones, all over their vehicles. Um, they they even had times when the motors would be turned on to the vehicles. They never removed them, but it turned on the motor, so they quit leaving their keys in the cars. And then they began to um, explore the small house. And in the book, I have lot. If you want pictures, I have lots of pictures with that. Um, you can see the muddy handprints all over the door. You could see where they were struggling to try to figure how to get in there. They eventually got in. Uh, one time the, the woman uh, went to town and she left the clothes drying in the dryer. And when she got home, there were these muddy prints all around the dryer. It's as if they were watching it, the clothes turn, uh, just like you would watch TV. Uh, she decided that she and her uh, children would move out of that house and move into the big house which is where her parents had lived. And then it started at the big house. And um, one of the most interesting things was they the Bigfoot pretty much left the living room alone. They chose to go upstairs where the children lived. Now, these are not young children. These are, you know, I think maybe at least 12 years old and the, the oldest one is like a teenager. They went into the kids' room. And we really do think it was the young Bigfoot that were doing this because there were these drawings on the wall. They had taken like crayons and things like that and everything was below the, the light switch. The Bigfoot would have a hard time squatting down to get that low to do these things. So we figured the kids had done it. And then they went into the bathroom they tore up the toilet. We all were grateful they didn't know what the toilet was for, though it would have made a great DNA sample. Um, they squeezed the toothpaste all over the place. Um, the teenage daughter uh, would was afraid, and she would lock her bedroom door, and even when she wasn't there. And I have pictures of where you could see the hands of the Bigfoot had gone under the little space underneath the door. And you can see these big claw marks uh, trying to open the door uh, by pulling it from the bottom. Um, these people were scared. Uh, the, the woman got herself a bodyguard who carried a gun, and she eventually moved off the property and just would come back every day to check on the place. Um, I was there with some other people trying to figure out exactly what was going on. So. This is what had really happened. They, the people, the human people, had been renovating or uh, fixing the pond. The pond was created by damming up the stream. And so there was a guy out there with a jackhammer and going through, uh, just drilling down. He went through bedrock and suddenly all the water in the pond went down this hole. We eventually figured out that the Bigfoot lived in the cave beneath that. They were really, really pissed that their little underground home had been destroyed. That also explains why they were muddy all the time. Their hands were muddy, their feet were muddy, they left prints and stuff everywhere. Um, and this is where telepathic communication comes in. The, the woman and also another person who came in later communicated with the Bigfoot that they didn't mean for that to happen, that it was an accident. They didn't know that they lived beneath that, that they would never have done that to them. So the humans are apologizing. Guess what? After that apology, there was this piece of burlap that had been shaped into like a basket that was placed in front of the, the, the front door of this big house. And there were all these little things in this little makeshift burlap basket. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember what they were right now, but there was like shiny things. There were some old coins, uh, different things. And they had left that as a peace offering. And after that, they didn't have trouble anymore. So they went from being terrified and having a bodyguard with a gun um, to, you know, making, making up and understanding each other. That's an amazing story. It would be fascinating. Yeah, you, don't get, you, if you don't get stories where it does like a full circle. It would be fascinating if some of those coins were hundreds of years old. 
yeah, it would. It probably would be. It, and there was one shiny thing that was kind of a like a goldish color. I could not tell from the shape of it what it was. I really, really couldn't. But uh, it, it, it would catch the eye. And it's very common that they Bigfoot will leave um, crystals or uh, pieces of um, granite or something that has a reflective quality to it. Uh, so when they really um, begin to have a rapport with some humans, there will be gift exchanging. Oh, let me tell you another story about gift exchanging. Sure. Uh, we were doing our food experiments in, uh, in one part of the mountains, and all of us went on vacation at Christmas time, and so all the food stopped. Well, we had also put out um, some things I had done with a wood burning set. Um, I did a, I think it was a butterfly, and we'd left the butterfly out for them. Well, they had taken the butterfly, and after we got back from vacation, they had returned the butterfly. And all we could think of was we had stopped putting food out for them. And they may have thought that they had done something wrong by taking the, the um, I don't know, the little butterfly. And so they returned it. We don't know. We're trying to get into their minds, and that's the best we can do. Do the Cherokee Indians in the area have any myths or legends of any other beings? If they do, I don't know much about them. Um, they always talk about shape shape shifters. Not always. Some of them do. Uh, I have not explored that a whole lot, but they definitely believe in the in the in the Bigfoot and the little people. You mentioned your website earlier, and it's called skyshipsovercashiers.com. What other articles do you have there if people want to check it out? As I've told you, either on or off the air, I don't know which. Uh, we started that website because there were so many UFOs being over seen over the town of Cashers, North Carolina, and we've grown way beyond that. And we'll get into archaeological stuff. We will get into um, underground bases. We have five of them that I have found out about here in the mountains. Um, you've heard us. You've heard me talk about Antarctica. You've heard me talk about um, all sorts of things. So what happens is I get bored very easily. And if I get curious about something, I'd like to go up and, 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 and learn about it. So there's a, quite a bit of diversity in the, in the website. Do you have any other books besides Cherokee Little People Were Real and Bigfoot Beyond the Footprints? Uh, the one that you and I have talked about before, um, which is um, Spy in the Sky, that's the short name, or Spy in the Sky, uh, Secrets and Cover-Ups uh, on Earth and Beyond. Uh, I've written another one on underground bases hidden in North Carolina mountains and another one on tangible evidence of Jesus. And what I did on that last book, which seems to be totally different than anything else, is that I waded through all this research that these people do and they have to write big, thick books and make things complicated. And, um, and I boiled it down so that people could really understand it. And, um, there's just a whole lot of evidence that's been left behind. Um, and so that book um, has a lot of photos in it. These books can be found on Amazon? Yeah, that seems to be the only way to go. Yes. If somebody wants to ask you questions, are you open to that? And if so, what's the best way to reach you? Again, go back to the website, skyshipsovercashers.com. And on the left-hand side, there's different categories of subjects we get into. Up near the top, uh, there's one, how to make contact or how to report a UFO. And you can uh, reach me through that information. Interesting. Do people report UFOs to you often? They did a lot more than uh, in, in the beginning than they do now, because now most of us have seen so many little blips going through the sky that just showing more and more and more of those gets boring. And uh, so we don't print as many of them. as It has to be more unique for us to to print those now. Do you think that full disclosure will happen anytime soon? We are the disclosure and the government won't tell any more than they're forced to tell. And so there are now programs like yours, websites like mine, um, that are like a, a little net, not a little network, actually quite a large network. And so the information is coming from the bottom up and it's pushing the guys at the top 
to reveal more and more. Uh, to this day, they keep talking about um, things in the future, like we're going to go to Mars. Well, I have clearly found evidence that's got me convinced totally that, um, um, you know, we, we're already there. Well, Mary, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? I believe you asked me that the, when I was on before, and I said something about being kind. This is a similar comment. Be respectful. And there's a book which I've never read, but I love the title. It's something like uh, all you ever need to know you learned in kindergarten or all I ever le learned to know I learned in kindergarten. And it's about being respectful, about taking turns, um, about sharing. We seem to have forgotten some of those basics that most of us were taught back in kindergarten and first grade. And we need to begin to be more like a kind kindergartner. That's a great message. Mary, thank you again for joining me. I wish you the best and let us know if you come out with a new book. All righty. Thank you so much. I wish you the best with what you're doing. Thank you. Buenos dias. <laughs> All right. Care. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.